Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, the speaker is in the room. We are ready for an on-time start at 2.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's in about three and a half minutes. So again, thank you for your joining us and we'll be back to you shortly. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us at the, uh, this session. We're going to get started in about two minutes time, a little less. The speaker is in the room. He's ready to go. So again, thank you for joining us and we'll be starting momentarily. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining the session. My name is Joe Fitzgerald with Money Show. I'll be your moderator this afternoon. We appreciate you coming. A couple of bits of housekeeping. We'll get right into the presentation with Ted. First and foremost, we wanted to thank everybody who attends these events virtually and, of course, face-to-face. -face. And, of course, we uh, thought leaders like Ted for joining us. We appreciate you all. Please keep those comments and feedback coming to us here at Money Show. It helps us continue to refine our process and bring more and more uh, education to you. Uh, with that, and also we're going to do some questions and answers, time permitting, at the end of this session. There is a chat box on your desktop. Shoot them over, and again, uh, time permitting, we'll get to as many as we can. With that said, I have the great pleasure of introducing everybody to Ted Bauman. Ted has dedicated his life in helping people secure and keep their wealth. Banyan Hill is a natural extension of his quest. Through his monthly newsletter, The Bauman Letter, and elite research service, Profit Switch, Mr. Bauman helps investors achieve true financial freedom. He is regularly quoted in leading financial publications and has authored several best-selling books on finance. Thank you very much for being with us, Ted. The floor is yours, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Uh, as you said, my name is Ted Bauman. Uh, I'm the editor of the Bauman Letter, uh, which is a financial newsletter. If you're interested in uh, learning more about me, you can look at the, uh, the uh, yeah, there we are, that's the, the URL at the bottom. Now, I'm going to talk today about trading in a no fundamentals market. That's a market where things are not rational, I would say, at least from the longer term perspective. And let's talk about why that is the case. The first reason, I believe, is that uh, the stock market is heavily overvalued. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. At least the, uh, the, the metrics that we can use for that are pretty straightforward. This is the so-called Buffett indicator. This is the relationship between the uh, stock market total market cap valuation versus the GDP. Uh, we're at the highest level we've ever been. That means uh, that uh, really fundamentally, we have nowhere to go but down. Here's another way of looking at it. This is um, the price, or, so, sorry, the Schiller CAPE ratio. Uh, we're again uh, at historically high levels. We're at um, just almost where we were during the dot-com bust. Now, here's one that shows the uh, uh, basically a number of different measures of valuation going back to the uh, 1950s. And by any measure of valuation that you care to, sorry about that, let me go back. By any measure that you care to uh, choose, we are at historically high valuations. PE, CAPE, dividends, you name it, we are overvalued. Now, all of that has led to a lot of fear in the market. I liken it to a mousetrap, the ready to spring. Now, there's no specific reason why the market should crash, but people often get nervous about it when we get to these valuation levels. One reflection of that is the, uh, the VIX, which is the fear gauge, the volatility index. Um, it's at historically high levels. If you go back uh, really over the last decade, we're still at the upper end of the normal range. Uh, we've obviously seen a lot of volatility over the last year, but um, here is uh, basically the, the volatility of the VIX itself. And, and that volatility, the up and down in the, the fear gauge itself is way above the norm. So we are in a difficult trading environment. Now, there are a couple of things I would say not to buy right now. I'm going to go through those. Uh, you know, pretty quickly. One is you don't want to be buying, um, I think, treasuries because yields are really uh, low at the moment. There's really no reason to be, uh, you know, to be wasting your money there. They've been sliding, uh, but they continue to uh, be on a downward trend. Now, it's pretty obvious what happens when we get into that kind of scenario, uh, and that is that you're wasting money if you put it in the bank. So don't put your money in the bank. That's not a good thing to do. Uh, the critical thing, I think, is that you don't want to, uh, you know, be earning less than what you could be earning, uh, you know, somewhere else. Everybody knows this, but right now the gap between the uh, amount of money that you can earn in the stock market, or, or sorry, from, from a savings account, and what you'd need to beat inflation is at all-time highs, as it has been for the last decade. Now, here's another thing I would suggest right now is not a great time to buy, and that is the more speculative growth stocks. I'm sure everybody has heard about um, the, uh, you know, the ARC uh, ETF, um, that's Kathy Wood's ETF. She's really good at identifying uh, potential growth stocks, but she's taken a big hit this year. The problem that, that I see is that a lot of people have actually um, essentially learned to, uh, to trade over the last five years, a lot of retail investors from trading things like the kind of stocks held in ARC. Um, but this year, they're on a downward trend, and it's become it's been a big shock to the system for a lot of people. Um, the green line is the um, uh, the 50 day moving average of her ETF, and it is starting to pick up a bit recently, but that's looking more like a, a downward sloping triangle, really. Um, and so I would be worried about where it's going to go. Basically, people are not prepared to uh, return to the growth trade, even though interest rates are very low. The red line being the S and P 500 uh, easily beating that this year. Here's something else you don't want to buy. I'm sure I don't need to tell you why, but these, these are some Chinese uh, stocks. This is, these are the stocks that got slammed last week uh, when the Chinese government said uh, no more profits in the online educational sector. Uh, I wouldn't touch China with a 10-foot pole right now. There's some exceptions. I think there might be some legs left in the EV sector. The only problem there that I would watch out for is that EVs are also a data trade because as the Tesla has shown, um, collecting information and you know the software in EVs is also part of it. But nothing else, folks, right now, you just cannot, cannot go there. Um, it's just too unpredictable. Uh, I wrote an article recently in my Bauman Daily, my daily um, e-letter, where I talked about the reasons behind this. 
I don't think these reasons are going to change anytime soon. Uh, lastly, unless you like roller coasters, I'd be careful about investing in cryptocurrency. I know there are a lot of true believers out there, but I'm not one of them. Um, I'm kind of an old fogey, I guess you could say. I'm not denying you can make money there, but look at the volatility. Not a, it's not a, a safe store of value. It's not a reliable means of, of exchange. I mean, it's a speculative asset. And right now, despite a recent uptick, it's still um, a dangerous speculative asset. Lastly, what about the reopening trade? What about the, the growth of the economy? Well, I think a lot of people have recognized that all that stuff got priced in very early, probably starting in November last year. Bank of America uh, feels that over the next couple of years, we're not going to see much price appreciation in things like home builders or industrial commodities or materials or transports. Um, a lot of people still seem to think, well, well, let's wait for the economy to restart. These things will go back up. Problem is, a lot of that stuff's already priced in, and that's the case right across the board. Finally, uh, here is, uh, you know, will earnings rec uh, rescue us? Will earnings be able to, you know, to help us? Um, I don't think so, because uh, they're on a year-on-year -year basis, obviously, they're pretty high right now. But they're falling and, and they got to fall because they got to go back to um, their normal rate of growth based on uh, previous you know, quarter, previous year, uh, which means that we can't expect earnings to save us. So the question is, why does the stock market keep setting records uh, in this kind of an environment? Well, here is my answer. It's what I call the mega cap illusion. Here's a, a, a slide that shows the relationship between uh, an equal weighted version of the uh, S&P 500 versus the actual version, which is market cap weighted. When that line falls, it means that um, the breadth of the stock market is falling and large uh, mega cap stocks are becoming more and more um, important and potent in terms of the overall market valuation. Uh, they assumed their highest uh, potency, if you like, um, their highest weight during last year's collapse when it was mainly uh, uh, mid-cap stocks that, that got knocked back. Mid-cap then rebounded. You see a pretty strong uptick in the last quarter. Um, you know, I said earlier that cyclicals picked up in November. That's that. But recently, look what's happened. We're starting to go back to the longer term trend. Uh, it's the big stocks that are winning the race. Uh, and uh, as I'm going to show you, we have... Uh, less and less market breadth, and that's dangerous. Here's a longer term perspective on the same thing. Interestingly, on the far left, you see that the equal weight and the market weight uh, versions of the S&P 500 tended to travel together pretty closely. They fell together pretty much the same rate during the COVID crash, but then the mega cap uh, stocks really lifted the market more than anything else. So a lot of what we were seeing was a growth in a, in a fairly concentrated group of stocks. And you know all the names, it's the Googles and so on and the Apples. Now here's something that a lot of people have probably missed. And that is that starting in uh, April, May this year, uh, those stocks, you know, the, the, the stocks that are really the middle market, the cyclicals, the, the consumer facing stocks, uh, they began to trade sideways. And that's that green box in the upper right corner. This blue line is the S&P 100, which is the top uh, group of stocks by market cap in the S&P 500. Look at them. They continue to rise. So what we're seeing is all these records that we're getting new, new highs are coming from fewer and fewer companies. Here's proof of that. This is the number of stocks trading above their 20-day moving average. Uh, it has fallen. That's the 50-day moving average of that indicator, the red line, and it is falling. It's picked up a little bit in the last couple of trading sessions, but uh, it is still uh, falling. And that means that market breadth is uh, narrowing, and that's never good for anybody in the stock market. Now, what about the Fed? The Fed won't save you this time, folks. That's my message, and I'm sticking to it. Here's why. Uh, right now, the Fed is in a in between a rock and a hard place, is what I would say. These two charts show something that are fascinating to me. And on the left-hand side, you see the rise of prices of the stock market, that's the gray line, and the rise of prices of houses going back to the 90s. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you see a total wealth as a percentage of nominal GDP. And that would be things like, you know, uh, yeah, basically net household wealth. Well, First of all, um, ever since the great financial crisis, the stock market uh, and to a certain extent, personal wealth, household wealth has skyrocketed. And they've done that because 
quantitative easing, monetary, you know, loose policy, whatever you, you want to call it, is like pushing on a string. It doesn't get to Main Street. It just goes into financial assets for the most part. <clears throat> I've always said that the most important part of the lending equation is the demand side, not the supply side. And interest rates um, are a supply side intervention. Trying to get banks to lend money by lowering interest rates doesn't work if, if people don't want to borrow it because they don't see good prospects in the economy. So right now, the Fed is in a position where they are being criticized, even by many people uh, on the conservative side saying, hey, you're distorting the economy. You, you're creating massive wealth at the top and doing nothing at the bottom. On the other hand, look what happens when they try to change that. This was back in 2018, fourth quarter, uh, when Powell began to talk about uh, running down the mortgage-backed securities and the uh, treasury bills on their balance sheet. Now, one, the market knows what happens when you do that. Uh, the Fed, by taking all of these financial assets out of the market, has essentially um, artificially constrained uh, supply. And when supply is constrained, uh, prices go up. Now, if they start dumping that stuff back onto the market, prices have to go down. That means uh, that interest rates have to go up for housing. Interest rates would have to go up for just about everything else. And that would mean that uh, the, the stock market would then go into shock mode as it did in late 2018, because low interest rates are key to the future valuations, particularly of growth companies. So uh, you, you can see what happened here. The S&P 500 collapsed uh, during the fourth quarter. I'm sure you remember it well. <clears throat> then it picked up a bit in January, traded sideways. And during that period, Powell was running everywhere he could, telling everybody who would listen that they were going to be flexible. And finally, the market accepted that. So this shows you that right now, um, the Fed, it, it cannot keep doing what it's been doing, um, but it also can't back off very quickly. Um, today's Federal Open Market Committee meeting minutes seem to suggest that, um, or, the, or at least the, the report back rather than the minutes, suggest that they are going to slowly taper, but I don't think the market believes them. So we're kind of stuck in, in, in sideways there. All right, here's the meat of it all. What do you buy in this environment? Well, here's my perception of the environment. I'm sure you've seen this before. This is Wiley Coyote running off a cliff. Um, I, I'm not suggesting, I just want to be clear, I'm not suggesting there's an imminent crash. Uh, I think that'd be the wrong thing. It's just that right now, anybody who has been expecting the market to continue as it has been really even over the last decade uh, is, is in that position. He, they're Wiley Coyote. They, they, they don't have a foot or, or ground underneath them unless they're thinking um, in, in much more nuanced terms. Now, what does that mean? Well, first thing, uh, the most undervalued part of the market right now is quality companies. This is a chart that shows the relationship between uh, an index of quality companies and the Russell 1000, which of course is a, a broader universe of US stocks. Um, it hasn't been this low since just uh, post the uh, dot-com bust. Uh, and it means that there's a lot of opportunities out there. What's a quality company? Strong balance sheet, um, not over leveraged, uh, good earnings, good market share. Maybe it's got a moat, the kind of stuff that Warren uh, Buffett and Peter Thiel like so much. Basically companies that uh, you can rely on. Now, I'll come back to this, but why do you rely on them? Because they have strong free cash flow. And ultimately, that's what you're buying when you buy a company, when you buy a share. You're buying free cash flow. You're buying the opportunities that free cash flow creates. Now, here's a, a chart that shows, again, something um, that, that confirms what I'm saying here about the undervaluation of those stocks. Uh, the top, again, is the Russell 2000. That's a proxy for you know, the broader market other than the, you know, those top stocks that I mentioned. Trading sideways, as I explained earlier for most of this year. Uh, the green line, the, the green uh, uh, index line is, is SPAK, which is a, an ETF that holds SPACs. And they have declined. That shows you that the risk trade is off the table. But look what's growing. The red line is quality U.S. stocks. That's an ETF, QUS. And the brown line is IQLT. Those are stocks that uh, internationally represent high quality. They've been growing at a steady rate since really uh, mid last year, late last uh, fourth quarter last year. That tells me something. That tells me that that's where the smart money is going. They're going into quality. Now, uh, here is a look at the stock market from the beginning of this year. And again, I think it tells a story and it's going to help us narrow down to where we want to look for quality. The top performer this year, year to date, is energy, um, which is logical because it's coming off a very low base. But look how much it's pulled back from its year to date highs. It's pulled back on concerns about future growth. 
But look what hasn't pulled back very much, and that's real estate. It continues to make highs. It's pretty close to its, its yearly highs. The only other segments that are in that uh, territory are consumer staples and consumer discretionary. So right now, um, the S&P 500 real estate segment is the, the hottest segment of, of, in the entire stock market um, you know, for year to date, uh, and it continues to grow. Now, um, this is going back to what I said earlier about free cash flow. Uh, free cash flow, cash flow gives you options. Cash flow is what allows companies either to invest or to grow or to pay dividends or to buy back stocks or whatever it is they're going to do. Right now, the company with the high, or sorry, the sector with the highest year on year change in uh, free cash flow is the real estate sector, up 4.5% year on year. Uh, look at everybody else. I mean, everybody else is still uh, down on that basis. Uh, it, other than consumer non-cyclicals and technology that, and, and industrials, that is the highest free cash flow yield this year. In fact, it is the highest other than basic materials. It, it, um, and I think that's, again, an indication that that's where smart money wants to go. Uh, now, let's put a longer term perspective on the same question. Um, this is an asset. Uh, this, this chart shows a 50-year perspective on asset class yields uh, over the last 50 years, long time frame. Other than emerging market debt denominated in dollars and preferred shares, U.S. high yield and REITs are the top performers. Look at the long-term performance of growth stocks and equity. Um, they are the two bottom performers. So over the long term, really companies that generate uh, high cash flow, high dividends, high yields, particularly in the real estate sector, the segment, uh, they are the top performers, uh, other than preferred, of course, which, which is a form of debt. Uh, it's quasi-equity um, and emerging marketing debt. Now, here's a, a slightly shorter time frame. This goes back to 1975. But again, it shows the, uh, the outperformance of REITs even above the S&P, uh, certainly above investment-grade bonds. It, needless to say, it blows away gold, but it also blows away inflation. Um, so really, REITs, uh, the, which is the form of real estate investment that I believe is the best one for just about for, for most people, uh, is the top uh, the top performer over the last uh, forty years or so. Even shorter, this is a twenty year perspective on the same thing, just to show you that this is not a, uh, an artifact of long ago stuff. Um, over the last 20 years, REITs, again, outperform. They outperform equities substantially. They outperform uh, even high-yield companies and small caps in emerging markets. Uh, they do much better than the average investor over the last 25 years. That's 2.5% uh, um, annualized returns. 12% almost annualized gains is where you want to be, I think. Um, forget about last year. If, you know, it, It's a one-off. Uh, you want to look at the long term here. Now, this is uh, some specific stuff. We're now at the shortest term. This is since the beginning of this year. This is VNQ, the Vanguard Real Estate ETF, which is mainly REITs. It has outperformed the market pretty solidly this year. You can see, uh, I don't have to interpret that. It's done very much better uh, than the overall market. And remember, that overall market, GSP, uh, the GSPC line there, that's the S&P 500, also includes those mega cap stocks that have been lifting the market. So it's been outperforming even the big heavy hitters like the Googles and the Amazons and so on. Here is an international perspective. This is the FTSE and NARIT composite, also beating the market uh, over the course of this year. Now, finally, one last thing, if I still haven't convinced anybody, this is going back to the great financial crisis. This is uh, the uh, all-inclusive NARIT index versus the S&P 500. Now, that includes reinvested dividends, but obviously that's what you should do with your dividends if you're not taking them as cash, if you don't need them yet. But it has been uh, just uh, completely blown away the market, and that is why I am so keen on them. Now, what about REITs and inflation? Um, REITs, of course, being special purpose uh, vehicles that uh, have special tax treatment, they have to pay out 90% of their uh, their potentially uh, taxable income to uh, their shareholders, so they're a special animal. Uh, but that's not the only reason why they grow so well. They grow well because uh, they're not, as Mark Twain said, they're not making any more land, and uh, that's that's one of the key things about it. But it's also because it's a business model where smart people can make good money. Well. In terms of the relationship between REITs and inflation, here is dividend growth per share going back to 1998 versus uh, the consumer price index. This only goes up to 2018. Um, I pulled this off of NARIT's uh, webpage this morning. So for some reason, they haven't updated it recently. But the message is clear. Other than the, the great financial crisis, dividend growth per share has 
completely trounced inflation um, and uh, definitely beat um, treasury yields over the same period. So that's a good inflation hedge. Now, what about different types of inflation? So even if we don't see high inflation, would it still be a good idea to buy REITs? Well, uh, in, in low inflation environments, you still get great income returns uh, from REITs. You get better price returns from the market, uh, but you still get overall better returns from REITs. In a moderate inflation environment, you get better returns from REITs, including about equal price, re uh, price returns, which is the increase in the share price plus, plus all the dividends. Um, in you know, by, by contrast, the S&P 500 is mainly about price. But in a high inflation environment, if one were to happen, God forbid, personally, I think inflation fears are overblown, uh, REITs definitely do better in terms of income returns, uh, and they do much better than the market. So they are a good hedge against inflation, including beating the market, uh, or as well as in beating the market, give, giving you good dividends, giving you good income. What about during the economic cycle? <clears throat> well, during the economic cycle, uh, you tend to see that REITs outperform in the early cycle, uh, stocks outperform in mid-cycle, late cycle, REITs are the way, the way to go. In recessions, they fall, but by much less than the market. And in all periods, again, REITs beat the S&P 500. Uh, so again, um, it, whether you're looking at it from the perspective of inflation or from the uh, perspective of, of market cyclicality, uh, REITs and real estate are the way to go. Now, let's look at this in one other way. Let's look at how uh, REITs performed in recessions in specific sectors. Uh, it, it's predictable that things like lodging and resorts REITs would uh, perform the worst during big, uh, steep recessions. That This is essentially after the... Um, uh, the great finance or during the great financial crisis, um, <clears throat> lodging and resort REITs fell, but look at the gains that you got if you bought them at the dip. I mean, that's just amazing. Um, you also got really good gains from office and retail and residential and healthcare REITs, um, somewhat less from industrials, but there are plenty of ways to make good money in the aftermath of a recession, particularly if you buy at the bottom. I mean, if, if you bought uh, like a lot of people did. I know I did last year. I bought into, uh, uh, for example, grocery store REITs uh, at the in, in sort of in April last year. Um, and I said, you know, people have to eat. They have to have groceries. They're going to come back to these REITs. And boy, we, you know, we made, you know, nearly, uh, I think, 85% uh, on, you know, with compounded total returns on one before we sold uh, about a month ago. So, so this is a great way to go during recessions. Now, I'm going to show you one other thing, which is uh, very self-serving. This is um, one of the sub-portfolios of my um, Bauman Letter service. This shows my endless income uh, portfolio year to date, uh, or actually, no, the last six months, vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis the Russell 2000, which is essentially the mid-market. That's that part of the S&P 500 um, that I've been talking about, the one that has been stalled for the last while. Uh, we've beat the market by, by quite a substantial percent uh, or, you know, and, and a lot of that comes from the fact that we've got high yielding companies in that portfolio. The typical yield, once you weed out a couple of outliers, is over 5%. Uh, and so um, I like compounding those, and that is where uh, things tend to be. So that's how my own portfolio has, uh, has performed. Uh, and you could, uh, too, be a part of this if you wanted to subscribe to my newsletter. It's not very expensive. I'm constantly on the hunt for higher yielding stocks, and um, that's where we tend to invest most of our resources. So that's it for me today. I'm now willing to take some questions. I'm going to go back to the opening slide. Thank you, Ted. Very insightful. A uh, couple of questions. Linda asks, aren't dividends treated as regular income on REITs? Well, it depends. They are uh, some of them are, are treated as regular income. It depends on whether they're qualified dividends. Uh, there are different ways of, of accounting for dividends, but typically a REIT will issue you a statement that shows the difference between um, the uh, uh, the actual uh, dividend income that you're getting, um, as well as things like return of capital, which they sometimes do for internal accounting reasons. <clears throat> but uh, yes, they can be treated as ordinary income, so that's something to keep in mind. But if you've got your money in a retirement account, particularly a Roth, there's nothing better than investing in a REIT and re um, compounding those dividends into your, uh, you know, into your holding in a, an IRA because you're not going to pay taxes on those until you withdraw, and you'll be doing that at the um, ordinary income uh, rate, obviously, when you withdraw. Uh, so uh, 
especially in a Roth, you know, like if you're in a Roth where you're not going to be paying taxes, that's the, the best possible investment strategy I can think of. REITs in a Roth. It sounds like a movie somebody should make. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John's asking, are you going to do an updated edition of your book for a post pandemic quote, new normal world? Well, it depends on which book you're referring to. I have a book called endless income, which is, um, uh, really about this kind of investment uh, approach, which is trying to you know generate income. And I have a chapter on REITs. Uh, we will probably update it. Um, but I, but fundamentally I don't see big, uh, changes in, in that particular market segment. I think, what we're going to, the place where there's going to be changes and where people need to be thinking about changing their strategy is in the growth segment of the market. Uh, I think you have to be very careful to, to assume that we can resume what we saw even in the last five years prior to the COVID crash because we don't have an obvious driver. As I showed, we have a Fed that wants and needs to withdraw support and go back to a normal monetary stance, which means that these companies are going to stand or fall, you know, growth companies like Kathy Wood's ARC Holdings on their performance. Um, and that means that they have to show bottom line. And a lot of these companies um, are, have become very undisciplined. They have to learn to do that. So that's going to be the tough part um, to get used to. All I'm saying is that in the meantime, until we establish a new direction, this is where you need to put your money. Look for free cash flow. Look for tax advantaged approaches like REITs. Uh, and remember um, that you can also look at uh, partnerships and other forms of investment where you get that 20% um, tax offset from the 19, 2017 a tax bill uh, where you get 20% of your, of your income tax deferred because it's technically a partnership. Thank you. Um, dovetailing that question then any reach you like now in light of their outperformance this year? Um, well, you know, I, I think that the, the, a lot of the, the REIT action has been priced in to be to be completely honest about it. I think um, the, on a on a price basis, a lot of REITs are, are more or less at fair value. I think there are some that are still undervalued. I think in the retail sector and particularly in the office sector, there are um, there are REITs that that are still trading below their net asset value and also trading before before or sorry below their historical pricing trends. Remember, when you look at REITs, you want to look at price to f uh, funds from operations, not price to earnings. If you go on Yahoo or Seeking Alpha or any place else, they're going to show you price to earnings, um, but price to free cash flows or sorry, funds from operations is what you want because otherwise it can appear alarming. Because if you calculate earnings on the same basis as a conventional company, you're, you're not you're going to see a, an unrealistic number. Um, I think that you you will find good um, investments in the uh, retail sector. I like Realty Income O uh, because they recently. Um, uh, announced a, a merger with Verit, which is which their biggest competitor. Uh, they're spinning off their office properties into a, to a separate REIT so that they can ring fence that and deal with that separately. But um, you know they they have great uh, contract terms. They have good free cash flow, uh, and so whether or not that REIT is it's a little bit underpriced relative to its long term trend. It's still worth uh, buying for potential appreciation. But REITs like that one um, that have strong balance sheets and, and can acquire property so they have accretive uh, growth in cash flow, those are the ones to look for. So I like, oh, uh, Simon Property Group, not so much. They continue to have problems with um, uh, bankruptcies and in some of their individual holdings. Uh, but generally speaking, I think if you, if you look uh, also in healthcare, there are still some bargains to be had. Uh, particularly the senior living healthcare companies, uh, people are still a little bit leery about them, and they will be until uh, uh, COVID is, is finally uh, cornered. So those would be some of the options I'd look at. Um, about it, it, things like gaming, lodging, that sort of stuff, you can still find value there as well. Ted, you just knocked out like six or seven questions <laughs> literally on that. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> last thought, uh, last question for you. Thoughts on gold right now. Do you have any thoughts on gold? You know, uh, sure, hold gold. I mean, hold five to ten percent of your portfolio in gold. But um, right now, I don't see gold as as the solution to any particular problem at the moment. Um, I, I'm not uh, an inflation hawk like a lot of people. Um, I look at the underlying numbers, not the aggregate. And you know, when you see the divergence between the very high rates of inflation in one or two areas, like used cars and and uh, energy and transport and stuff like that. And the rest of the market, you realize that this is not liable to continue. And so I don't see that happening for, for gold, um, you know, because obviously people buy it uh, in a high inflation environment. Um, on the other hand, it's always good to have. And I think, you know, having 
10% of your portfolio in gold, five in physical and five in, in good, strong ETFs um, and gold mining companies, particularly gold miners that um, have high free cash flow. That's, that's always a good bet. But it, gold right now is a, a solution in search of a problem, I think. I know that's heretical, but that's, that's the way I see it. Ted, thank you very much. We're out of time. I really want to thank you for your insights. We had a great crowd in the room today. A lot of good questions. There was some we didn't get to. So I would urge you guys to get with Ted directly at the Bauman letter. He'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you have. And with that said, I want to thank everybody who comes to these events virtually. Keep in mind, folks, we are back to live events. Also, our next and last for this year live event will be held in Las Vegas, September 12th to 14th. But again, keep those comments and feedback coming to us here at Money Show. It makes us better. It continues having us to continue to refine our process. Ted, uh, you're a great thought leader, and we appreciate you always for your insights. And I wish you a good day, and I wish everybody else a good day. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Have a great one, Ted. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Be well, sir.